welcome to the Women on the Wall radio show. We are excited to, to be here on this beautiful morning in studio live in Arlington, Texas. And we've got a lot that happened last week that we need to talk about because we need to let everyday moms and dads, grandparents, taxpayers know what's actually happening in their local school board uh, elections, what happened last week, and what are the structures and the organizations that are controlling what happened last week. So that's what we're going to talk about, and I've got some wonderful guests in studio with me today. So I'm going to move on the other side of the camera and let them take uh, center stage, and, and I'll introduce them to you. And we're going to start with you, Jerry. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. You ran for Crowley ISD School Board. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. And tell us why you ran. I guess initially I got I got in interested in um, and into doing it because my daughter was going to school at um, one of the Crowley Elementary Schools, and um, she was being made to dance to some provocative music. Um, it had sexual lyrics, racial lyrics. Um, there were just things that I, I feel is out of line uh, for, uh, she was seven at the time in second grade. And um, it was also going on at, at different school events like their, uh, fall, their carnival, um, their field day, um, trunk or treat, different things. Um, the PTA was involved with I'm hiring a DJ to play these songs. Um, it was going on in in um, PE class, and mm. um, she had asked if she could bring Christian music to school, and the teacher said no, not if it not if it says the word Jesus in it. Um, <laughs> and so it was just a just a lot of different things. Um, in December, she finally she brought a book home that was in her teacher's classroom. Uh, I guess the teacher had a her own personal little library um, and my daughter brought a book home that had um, how human life is conceived and it was a, it was a science book but it, it had some uh, sexual things in there um, very very informative diagrams and 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 um, literature as to how human life is conceived and I, and I just feel that it was out of line for for second grade, um, the district has policies about that. Um, in I, I believe it's the fifth and sixth grade range. Um, so she, it, being her having her in second grade was, I felt that it's out of line. So I I tried to get it straightened out with the district, with the principal, with the um, administration, the district administration, superintendent, school board, and, and just nobody seemed really interested at all in listening to me. So that's that's really what prompted mine my campaign to, to run. To so. step up. You were a dad I'm who dad. stepped up. I'm a concerned dad. <laughs> I just think that uh, it's out of line. You know, it's, it's out of line. Great, so. great. And Sybil Lane, you are a current school board member in Crowley ISD. Tell us a little bit about your story and why you decided to run. Um, okay. Uh, I actually worked for Crowley ISD for many years as a substitute, as a teacher's aide, got to know many of our teachers. We have several wonderful teachers that I uh, really enjoyed working with during that time. Um, I had my fourth child um, and resigned from my position. And uh, then I decided after some issues with my, my own children in public education, um, I have two children that have some special needs. Um, mm -hmm. One suffers from dyslexia, other, the other has mental illness. Um, and after some negative experiences with um, things going on uh, with our special ed students, uh, I got to see it twice with two different children. Um, I decided um, that I wanted to run for school board um, because I really felt like we were ignoring some of the needs of our students that are do you have special ed we can spend a ton of money on things that do not provide education for our children but we cannot spend a little bit of money on our children that have dyslexia to help them read my son uh, in particular um, I was told he's not the worst one, and so we cannot give him any additional services. 
Um, he was in second grade, getting ready to go into third grade the next year, and could not read on a first grade level. And I just couldn't accept that. Um, and I know that there's many other parents in our district that felt the same way. Um, so I decided after pulling him out and home educating him to, so he could read, because I think that that is the most critical thing for a child when they're in school to learn, is right. to learn to read. I'm very, very passionate about that. Um, he's reading successfully, <laughs> um, but I still care very much about those kids that I got to meet when I was a substitute teacher. Um, I would go into classrooms and students wouldn't know what a glossary was, how to look up a, a, a guide word, and, and it, it frustrated me so much. And I was like, we've got to do something to improve the quality of education for those kids that I can't help. Mm -hmm. um, and so it prompted me to run for school board. Um, unfortunately, um, I am the only one that has really voiced that, that very serious concern. Um, our district only has two librarians currently for all of our 20 some campuses that we have. Wow. Um, and librarians inspire children to read. They are critical for our children. And uh, I would really like to see, you know, our board, you know, that we have currently address that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that, you know, I have been uh, <laughs> giving them enough information the last year that that, that will make a difference. Great. Well, and it's, it's interesting. We're going to watch a, a video um, in just a minute, and I think you'll find it very interesting as it pertains to um, exactly what you're talking about. What, what, what money is being spent on, what's going on in education nationally, and how that affects us locally. So, Rusty, you're up next. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you ran for school board in Crowley ISD. Well, the first thing I'm proud to say, as my son did graduate this year, and I don't like to necessarily echo what these other two have said, but it's the same thing. My son suffered from dyslexia. Um, me being a single father, I'm the only person that he had. And there have been many, many times I had to go physically take the state law to the school to get them to do what the law requires them to do so that he would have an equal opportunity of education as any other child. Mm -hmm. So that spurred my interest in you know, it's hard enough having a, a child with disabilities at home and then you get the pressures of school peer pressure, um, then they feel that they're unsuccessful simply because he had dyslexia, uh, the peer pressure of ha actually having to have people read to him. But the problem was, is the teachers wouldn't read to him. So then he was expected to test on information that he could not understand. So I didn't think that was fair. So that, that got me going in this. and as I continued my efforts, then it really opened my eyes to what's going on. Right. Great. And Misty, you've got an interesting story too as well, and, and I think you have really seen the harsh reality uh, to the extent that some people will go to make sure that the people they want on the board get on the board versus Absolutely. the people who are stepping up to run to make your local school district wonderful, everyday moms and dads who Absolutely. have a vested interest in their children. So tell us a little bit about your story. You know, I never really intended to do this. Um, I had a concern as a parent and a taxpayer. Um, I lived in the district for 20 years. Our district was very successful. Um, I did start seeing a decline for many different reasons in our district. Um, my husband and I have three children um, the other two graduated from Crowley when it was, uh, it was doing really well academically. Um, we late in life had another one. Um, she's 12 now. Um, and when she started school, I would say about third grade is when I started noticing a change in curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, the love for school left. Um, the crying. 
uh, stomach aches, I don't want to go to school. Their concerns were that she's not paying attention, she must have ADD, you know, all of those things. I too had to take the law up to the school and um, give them my interpretation of what the law stated because they were giving me their interpretation. <laughs> um, and you know, I just, I was at a forum and they had the uh, State Board of Education candidates there. I asked a simple question. Are you going to do a better job of funding special education and getting the children that were left behind and falling through the cracks more help? Because I was told the same thing. My daughter was not the worst of the bunch. Mm -hmm. She fell through the cracks. You know, she could read at a better level, but she suffered in other ways. She had dysgraphia and dyscalculia, which districts don't recognize those learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. And when I was met with, well, you don't know what you're talking about, or I've never seen anything like that, that's when I decided after, you know, speaking to my husband and talking about it, we decided that there was a need. We definitely had a need, and as a parent and taxpayer, I should step up to that plate. And so that's what I decided to do. Great. I, lo and behold, I did not know I would hit the opposition that I hit. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk about that yes. in just a minute. And Andrew, um, you're not in Crowley ISD. You're in Northwest ISD. But you are a dad who uh, saw what was coming into your, your child's school district. And you started going to the school board meetings and in, in your three-minute opportunity to speak up, voiced your opinion, and um, decided to run as well. And um, I'd love to, to just hear a, a short um, why you felt the need to run, and, and now that you've seen this opposition, are you going to go away, or are you going to stay in the battle? Sure. Sure. Well, first of all, I want to say uh, this is encouraging to meet all these great people that seem to have kind of the same perspective that I do and lets me know that what I did was the same thing that everybody else was doing for the, a lot of the same reasons. Um, as you mentioned, you know, the Common Core book in, the, in my son's backpack was what started this whole thing. And uh, <clears throat> it's been an extreme challenge um, with the opposition for sure. Um, a lot of people have seen some of what's happened in our district. We have an epidemic problem with special needs. My son is autistic, so I have also dealt with this special needs issue that these folks are talking about as well in my district, and I've heard that there's a major problem there. Um, in hindsight, looking back at what, what just happened with the election, I don't regret it for a second. Um, matter of fact, I feel encouraged. I learned a lot from this election. I learned how they play. I learned who the players are. Um, I learned a lot of things I didn't have any idea about. And these people are reaching across districts. They're located in one district and they're reaching across multiple districts to attack people. I, I'm, I'm meeting people in the Tea Party that um, have been attacked by some of these same people. So um, am I going away? No, I made a promise I'm not going anywhere uh, and I'm here to stay. I'm here to stay, I'm here to fight this until we win. As the more we talk about this, the more we work together, uh, the more people come out and realize that there's other people out there with the same concerns. They don't feel alone anymore. They can jump on board. And this is, I mean, this is a testament of it right here. There's all these people and some that couldn't make it today. Right. So. Right. And, and that's, yes. Thank you. Good. And you know, that's uh, the way that I felt when, um, after Thomas Ratliff filed um, ethics charges af against me, I, I kind of had to laugh because... Twice. It, right? Twice he did. Um, but I had to laugh because he thought it was me that was doing it. And it wasn't me. And he could take me down. But there's a whole army of moms and dads and taxpayers and people that are just as angry as I am. So he can, he can take me down. But there's people coming in right behind me to stand up and fight. So I'm encouraged that all of you came here today and are willing to speak out. And, and I think there's some real value in understanding, like you said, Andrew, who the players are, how they play, and, and what we need to do 
to strategically take back our schools and that's what this is all about. I want to play a video. We're going to listen um, to Chris Tinkin. Um, he, he's a great, great guy. He's a professor teaching in, in the field of education, but he's written a book on the myths and lies of education reform. And um, I'm just going to show a part of a documentary that he's done. Um, and, and it's really to expose this common core. Why do we have one uh, set of standards or why are we going down this common path when obviously with, with your children, none of our children are common. All of our children are special. So let's, let's listen. America is a large and diverse country. It covers approximately 3.8 million square miles. It's the third most populous nation on the planet with approximately 320 million people. Over 40 languages and dialects are used regularly. There's six time zones for 50 states, covering seven major geographic regions. America has 11 climates and the world's most complex and largest economy. If California was a country, it would be the eighth largest economy on the planet, ahead of Russia, India, Italy, Canada, and Australia. Approximately 50 million children attend public schools that prepare them to be contributing and responsible members of a diverse and democratic society. In a country this diverse, how could it be that in 45 states, there's now only one national standardized curriculum in mathematics and English language arts? only one pathway to college and careers? Furthermore, how could bureaucrats in over 40 states think it's a good idea to administer one national standardized test, all without scientific evidence to support the effectiveness of their plans? It's disturbing. Bureaucrats and some business elites are in the process of attempting to standardize and homogenize almost 50 million public school children in a country of vast diversity, through a network of policymaking enforced with corporately controlled standardized tests. This is problematic for at least two reasons. First, loss of local control. And also, the quality of the results from these standardized tests aren't what you think they might be. As a taxpayer, I want to have the opportunity to participate in my public schools. But those opportunities are being erased by a system of centralized curriculum and testing. National testing is going to hasten the loss of democratic decision making in local schools. Standardized testing is already being used in many states to impede citizens' democratic influence from the public schools. For example, education bureaucrats in many states instituted teacher and administrator evaluation systems that link employment and salaries to the results from national standardized tests. Also, student promotion is going to be tied to results in some states, like Ohio. And in other states, if students' parents opt them out of the national standardized testing, the students will have to attend some dead-end summer school program or be retained in grade, even if the students passed all their coursework during the school year. So now, in states with those types of policies, regardless if teachers, community members, and administrators know that things like the Common Core State Standards and National Testing are dataless initiatives, they'll be almost powerless to stop the standardized train wreck for fear of losing their jobs or harming their children. Parents, students, and educators are being forced to comply with a broken system that has no evidence to support it. Professional judgment, local expertise, scientific evidence, moral responsibility, and ethical behavior have been subjugated at the altar of centralization and standardization brought on by an ever-expanding relationship between America's growing corporate education complex and policymakers. Although all of this has been sold to the American people as a state-led initiative, it's really de facto national standardization of the public school population via political pandering and state and federal incentive policies tied together by testing companies. Given our country's culture and long history of local control, this policy-making trend of using standardized testing to drive compliance 
with policies that centralize education is alarming. Now, we have Democracy's Incubator, the locally controlled public school, set to become something for the history books in at least 45 states. And for what? The quality of this newly imposed corporatized and centralized system is not better than a diverse network of free, locally controlled public schools. Sometimes I get the feeling as if some of these captains of business who are selling us these standardized assessments are tired of their boardrooms and want to play school. To them I would say, stay out of the public sandbox. The results from these national tests won't tell us about student creativity, innovation, strategizing, problem solving, compassion, empathy, cooperation skills, cultural literacy, persistence and resilience, or any of the other traits that transcend subject matter and time and make productive, cognitively nimble, and civically responsible adults. But national testing and straight-jacketed curriculum will rob millions of students of their childhoods as they spend hours upon hours engulfed in test prep and stressed out about not being promoted to the next grade or being defined as a test score. I know, Andrew, you experienced with some of the pushback came from your local PTA, that there, was, there were people within these PTA organizations who were working um, inside the school to make sure that you guys didn't get elected. Correct. Um, why is that? And so I want to show many people don't know really the history of the PTA. Um, and what that structure really looks like. And last night on the Women on the Wall conference call, we had a wonderful woman from Maryland, Cindy, who explained to us the structure, the power structure behind the, the national PTA and how it influences locally. The birth of my last little daughter, an idea came to me. Why not have a national congress of mothers whose growth would quickly become international? With those few words, Alice McClellan Burney shared the moment of birth for an organization that transformed forever the world's perception of how society should treat children. In 1897, and for decades surrounding it, many children, especially the poor, were given little or no education and put to work to help support their families. The work was hard, the hours long, and the toll on their childhood devastating. Alice wanted to change that. She found the perfect ally in Phoebe Hurst, wealthy philanthropist and wife of Senator George Hurst. The two women set about organizing a national meeting of mothers and fathers to address the pressing issues of child labor and education. With the help of Phoebe's son, Randolph, and his publication connections, word of the event was spread across the country. Even so, Alice remained humble about her expectations for attendance. I shall be satisfied even if only 25 mothers are there. That first convention of the National Congress of Mothers held in February 1897 was attended by more than 2,000 people. During the meeting, a platform and a declaration of principles were established to guide the mission of the organization. The PTA found friends in both the U.S. Congress and the White House, with allies like President Teddy Roosevelt, whose involvement, along with other leaders, further reinforced the early mandate to include fathers in the movement. 
As the association moved forward into the early 1900s, it grew from 100,000 members to 2.5 million, which included members of the National Congress of Colored Parents and Teachers, founded by Selena Sloan Butler, a dedicated and tireless pioneer and advocate of opportunities for both children and women. The spirited work of Selena and her colleagues led in time to the unification of her organization with the National Congress of Parents and Teachers. As the association grew, it reinforced standing policy issues and introduced new initiatives that established the association as the world's primary child advocate, always mindful of its primary objectives. Today, the PTA operating out of their new headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, is still the nation's premier advocate on issues of child welfare and family engagement in education. Unique in its mission, the PTA is the nation's premier advocate for every child, no matter who they are or where they go to school. It monitors public policy and encourages the role that family engagement can play in a student's academic success. The PTA tirelessly advocates for provisions in legislation that strengthen family engagement and assures their implementation. Still advocating for early childhood education, the PTA supports a variety of programs that provide early education for low-income children. The association continues to work with the U.S. Congress and the Department of Education to ensure that programs that provide quality education across the country are equitably funded and implemented. So, it's interesting when you look at the, how long the PTA has been in existence. I didn't, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize how much the PTA plays a role in legislation and in policy setting. And when you think about your local PTA, I think about, I, I know the moms in my neighborhood who are, who are great moms, they do a wonderful job at our local PTA. They, they do fundraisers, they bring money in the door for our local, especially at the elementary school. Um, they do donuts with dad and get the dads involved. The dads are now involved um, with the patrols in the morning, making sure the kids are getting out of uh, the cars safely. Um, there's some wonderful things happening at the local level. And many of you probably know your, your local PTA moms like I do, who are great. But it's interesting because when you start digging into the websites of our local PTAs and then you connect those to the um, state website, the Texas PTA, and then you realize what we just realized a couple of weeks ago that the National PTA Association is coming to Texas in Austin um, they're having their national convention June 19th through the 22nd. And lo and behold, the keynote speaker is Arnie Duncan, the largest cheerleader for the Common Core National Standards. And when you look at the, the sessions at that conference, it's all about talking to moms and dads about the benefit for their children's private data to be collected in the name of education research. It's all about, you know, the feel good. But let me ask you, seeing what you see in your children's schools, what your children have been through, do you feel like what's happening at the local level is really advocating for your child. Andrew? No. <clears throat> no? No, I don't think so. It's obvious. Look at the math. Right. Look at the curriculum. Look at, look at how we were treated just for, just for stepping up and wanting to be involved. That's, and that's what we see. And what people perceive as the PTA, dads with donuts and, and doing all these great things, is not really, and when you look at the history behind the PTA, that's not how it was set up in the first place anyway. It was set up as an association to be an, a, a political machine behind policies that would be pushed down from a national level. Do you realize when you pay in Texas 
membership dues to your local PTA that a portion of that membership due goes to PTA National. So your PTA dues are paying for Arnie Duncan to come to Texas and, and to push Common Core. Does that make you mad, Misty? Absolutely. I never really joined the PTA till one year, and the year that I joined it, I really wasn't, I didn't see the parent-teacher association thing going on. It mm -hmm. was parties, fundraisers, a few group of moms, and you didn't see um, anything concerned about the education that was going on in our schools or any of those things going on. And I said, I'm not spending my money on something if it's not going to do me any good. Right. And it's not. It's not there for the parents. Um, it's there to, um, I perceive the PTA as a bunch of moms who do parties mm -hmm. and fundraisers. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's how I perceive them, and most people perceive them that way. They don't see them as on board to help with education or all those things, and that's originally what I thought anyway it was for, to help parents and teachers come together and work together, and that's not what it is. Well, and it's interesting because what's happening on the local level, the perception of the fundraising and the parties, and that all feels good. It does feel good. It feels very good locally. What's happening at the county and at the state level and at a national level, oh, they're advocating. They're working together, but they're advocating for policies that are progressive, yes. liberal policies. And when you see what is coming into our schools with this common core philosophy of education, so much of it is an illusion. Is. They create the illusion of feel good, like we're doing the right thing, but then they're coming in behind and doing things that are harmful because you've seen it firsthand with your own children. And it's interesting, I had a mom um, send me an email this morning and ask, what is the curriculum product that um, is out there that's bringing Common Core into my school district? And I said, well, it's more than just the curriculum product. You have to ask the question, who's training the curriculum director? Who's training the teachers in the summer? What conferences are they going to? And who are the keynote, or as they call them, thought leaders at their conferences? And in particular, in Texas, we have a real situation with math. You know, we don't have Common Core in, in Texas. We actually passed a law, HB 462, that says no to Common Core. But as you've seen, there's Common Core books but the math is obviously this common core philosophy. How is it getting in to Texas? Well, it's the Dana Center out of the University of Texas, and that is where the professional development of the curriculum directors and the, and the teachers, they're going to training at the Dana Center. Well, the people at the Dana Center are the ones doing the webinars to train in those 45 states in this new way of math. So when we're looking at our last line of defense for our children, you think about it, there's two very strong structures and organizations within our local schools, and all of you have dealt with them, the PTA and the school board. What is the professional development of the PTA members and your local school board. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because the, the Texas Association of School Board, you can tell us, when you go through training and professional development as a school board member, tell us what it's like. Um, it's probably one of the most interesting things that, that, <laughs> that I have experienced. Um, it is, you are to, taught as a school board member that you are a team, you are to agree, you are to collaborate and work together. And if you do not, then, you know, there's strategies, you know, um, 
that that they that they can make things difficult for you. <laughs> um, you know, they, one of the meetings that I went to, they said that you know, one of one of the board members, you know, they would drag out the meeting so long until the person had to leave. <laughs> and I was like, why would you do that? You know, because they didn't like the way the person was voting. They expect you to vote in line, and yeah, if you do sure. not, if you do not vote in line with their thinking. Um, you get yelled at. I've been yelled at by mm. our superintendent because I don't vote the way he wants me to. Wow. Um, I have been criticized by the, my fellow board members um, for my voting decisions. Um, and, and the most ridiculous thing about it is that even though I vote no, everything they want gets passed because I am the lone right. rebel on that board. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> that I vote no, but it still ends up being one of those things that really bothers school districts if you don't have a total in line type of thinking. Um, and that's something that they train you at, at TASB that that's what you need to do. Um, it's almost like a, uh -huh. a, a high school running campaign for class president. And where I've actually been in school board meetings uh, where they have like a, uh, a work session and there will be five sitting over on one side of the table and Sybil will be on the other side, complete the other side of the room. No mm -hmm. conversation, no nothing. It's like she's got cancer or something. But I mean, it's that dramatic and I, you can't emphasize that enough. It's, it is childish and I was explaining to a uh, board member who recently got a citation at uh, the polls uh, for disorderly conduct but I tried to explain to him we live in a democracy everybody has a right to their opinion right you may not agree right but she still has a right and was referring to uh, Misty and what her thoughts and beliefs were for her campaign. Right. That, I mean, we just went off the wall crazy. And of course, he had to deal with law enforcement for that. But it's just <laughs> that childish idea that we would go that far in a local campaign. It's the most childish thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Mm hmm. Well, and it's interesting because I'm sitting here looking at these different workshops. Um, one of them is how to help your PTA reflect your community. Learn how to make each family in your PTA feel invited, valued, and have a sense of belonging by assuring that your PTA is addressing your needs, your cultural beliefs, your traditions, your family structure of the population you serve. You will be given information on how to integrate and embrace each family's culture into your PTA. But then, as they're having those conference, uh, those meetings, then they also have meetings about how to handle a disruptive parent in a school board meeting. Um, <laughs> what do they consider a disruptive parent? Someone who doesn't agree with the way they're voting? how they're handling our school district and our tax dollars. Right. How they're teaching our children and what they're teaching our children. I mean, do we not count anymore as parents? Because that's how I feel. We don't count anymore as parents. Right. We are thrown to the lions. We are pushed out to the side. And if we speak <clears throat> up, then we are that disrupted parent. We are that one that is, as I was, uh, someone described me to our local parents, as a person seeking attention. I had to be the center of attention, and this is how I did it, by being disruptive and um, speaking badly of others. Thanks. Saul Alinsky, rule number 12. There are, okay, see, <laughs> I, I never did any of those things. My daughter got a phone call from a friend of hers that said that children in the schools are talking about how badly I acted at the polls. Children, their parents are telling them these things and they're taking them back to the schools. I'm like, these mm -hmm. are our children and I already said at one board meeting 
Children have no business in the middle of political arenas That's whatsoever. Right. That's this right. is a place for adults, and we should all act like adults. And that is not what happened during this race, and for any of us. It did not happen. Can I insert one thing? Sure. The response that we get on if we do come to the board in our little five minutes of talking. You get five minutes? We get five. We only get three. <laughs> You're going to get three. Uh, um, that get. could change, though. Yeah. Respect is given where it's earned. But we, we go to have gift presentation or discuss anything. Most of the board members are like this, their eyes rolled up, you know, not paying any attention at all to what we say. Give us no respect at all for what we have had to say and just waiting for our time to be up so they can continue on. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting. I have to say, as someone who's been going kind of uh, across the state and uh, talking to different folks who are running for school board or are dealing with these issues, it's so um, interesting how there are certain things that are seen across the board from district to district. And then there are those districts, I have to say, in, in our district, in Argyle, um, it, it's a different environment. Mm -hmm. And I think it is because we have had a history of school board members who have bucked the system, mm -hmm. who have bucked the superintendent. And when you look, Sybil, at the training that is given, you don't buck the superintendent. And so, and actually a lot of that was set up by former um, Lieutenant Governor um, Bill Ratliff, Thomas Ratliff's father, in Senate Bill 1, way back, um, it, it basically set up the structure where the, the superintendent is the key figure of the district. And then, and, and it's interesting because his hands are all involved in the Texas Association of School Administrators, mm -hmm. those superintendents, the professional development, the training of the superintendent, and the professional development of the state board, I mean of the um, Texas Association of School Board. So when we think of local control, Jerry, in listening to this, when you think of local control, do you see local control as you as a dad and a teacher and your child and what's best for your child? Or are you seeing it as a superintendent, the education service center that's servicing your district and the state board, the uh, Texas Association of School Board, those associations as being local control? I see it as parents and, and, and me having local control. What, what really, in reality, what it is, is the superintendent has local control. Mm -hmm. um, it's, that's how it is in, in Crowley. Um, right. So, so what I see it as and, and what, what I think it should be is, is us as parents and, um, you know, we should have control. They, in my opinion, you know, they, they work for us. And, right. Um, and the, the school board, they were hired. Um, the school board was voted, um, and they're public servants. Um, and so at a local, what I think should be local, um, that's not in reality what it is. It's, it's a, um, our, Rusty mentioned the, the board meetings. Um, it's just the superintendent, you know, yeah, we get a few minutes to voice our opinions, and, and you know, and like you said, it's just a, um, when will this be over? That's that's kind of the attitude. Um, no matter what you say, no matter what your complaint is, um, you know that they have no, they have no. It'll care never whatsoever. be put on an agenda. We can bring uh -huh. every problem up that we see, and it'll never be put on the agenda. They'll never address it. You can send emails. You can make phone calls. You can complain. You can get as many parents as you want to involved but it will never hit the agenda. They'll never, you know, all you'll hear is how wonderful things are going in Crowley ISD and probably right. at every school board you go to. You know, it's run the same way. That's Everything's right. all hunky-dory, great and wonderful and fine. But in reality, 
when you really start looking at it and you talk to the parents who feel browbeat and beat down and don't feel like they have a voice, there is something wrong there. Right. There really is. Right. Well, and when we when we talk about solutions, and that's really, um, I, I mentioned the National PTA Conference in June. Um, Women on the Wall has decided to host a counter convention across the street from, that. <laughs> <laughs> from the National PTA, and we actually have some voices in opposition to Arne Duncan and this Common Core philosophy of education. We have Dr. Sandra Stotsky, who was actually hired by David Coleman um, to validate the Common Core National Standards in English and Language Arts. And she would not validate them because she said it would put our American children back at least two to three years in English and Language Arts. We also have Jane Robbins with the American Principles Project, who many of you, because <coughs> once you start digging in and finding information, you're usually led to Jane Robbins and the American Principles Project, who has laid out in a 10-part series this whole uh, federal takeover of our education system. We also have Dr. Peg Lussick coming in from Pennsylvania, um, who I love her because I always talk about her, talking about why is there all these women who are out fighting in education, and in, in, not instead of men, but we see all these women. And it's because a man will, will die for his child. You guys would die for your child, but a mother will kill. And that's, that's the instinct that we're looking for is those moms to do the research and not to go out and be violent, obviously, but to go out and protect our children. And it's interesting, um, the other person that we've got uh, who's going to be coming on the radio show with us on um, May 29th is Dr. Duke Pesta. And he has been doing some phenomenal work in exposing this whole Common Core. And they are attacking him as well. And so when you put your head up like you guys did, you very well are going to, they're going to try to knock it off. And so we, we have got to come up with solutions to fight back. And um, I want to kind of go down the line and ask, after going through this and seeing what you have seen on the inside, Andrew, what, what would be your, what's your number one idea or solution for moving forward now that you've seen what you've seen? Me personally? Me per yes, you personally. Um, well, first of all, the thing I think that I realized the most was that the taxpayers and the parents don't really know what's going on. Um, I met a lot of people, especially the last two weeks running up to the election, met them for the first time. Um, it didn't take them very long. They were already looking for somebody. They had already figured some of this out on their own. And when they found our group, they it was like a breath of fresh air. We have just, I mean, the, the person, some of the groups that I'm in personally have grown um, 50, 60, 70 members in the last couple of weeks. Um, multiple groups have now spun off of this group and are growing very fast. So I would say that it's uh, crucial for us to get the word out to the taxpayers, to the parents, and to the teachers that have been uh, kind of snow, snow I, I hate to use the word snowed over, um, but the way that they deal with things within the schools, they don't talk about this very much and they steer away from it and those that bring it up are warned not to talk about it. Um, so getting the word out that there are lots of people already fed up with the system um, and people that can effectively uh, translate this information to the parents um, who come from so many different backgrounds. It's not a partisan issue. This, that people right. on, on both sides are angry about this. So being able to um, effectively translate that information to different people that come from different walks of life so they can understand it, um, I think is crucial. And if, if we can get that word out and we can get people to understand it, there, there's no way they'll stop us next time. And furthermore, if we can get these elections moved to November, right. we'll save the taxpayers millions of dollars across the state of Texas that they can use to put against Saxon math books. And everybody can vote if it's in November, not just the school people. Right. Very good. Very good. Misty? Um, 
Well, I've uh, decided to move forward and become a watchdog for our uh, school board because uh, really their meetings, nobody knows what goes on in them unless they go. There's very little um, output on when these meetings are, um, what goes on during them, and um, the parents don't know. Um, they have them in the most um, times when parents really can't be there, I guess you might say. Um, so I've decided to record them and uh, post them on my page. I am changing the name of my page, my campaign page. Um, um, I also uh, noticed during all of this how brutal some of the attacks are and personal, mm. how personal they get. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was amazing to me because I, as a parent, just wanted to do step up to the plate and I wanted to do some good for our district because our district was so great at one time. And I saw that maybe I could do something positive and help that. But obviously, I must not have been the person for the job. <laughs> but you know, it, um, you know what, what really, it, I thought this was a bipartisan race. Our race turned into, for us, turned into, you better pick a side here. You're either a, a, a Tea Party backer or you are a Democrat liberal. Which one are you? And you either want education to stay together or you want to dismantle it, as we were accused of doing. Mm. If we were voted in, we were going to dismantle it. Mm. Um, you know, things were said like, I've never seen so many teachers involved in a political race before. Well, you know, when you have board members running to the schools telling the teachers if you allow these people to get elected you will have no job you will have no fine art programs they will dismantle and take down our school system we must stop them how do you fight that back to the one well the school yeah house. and what's interesting is it's exactly the opposite yes. it's that illusion that's yes. created that you are the problem when in fact what is happening is those very teachers are going to be the ones that suffer the consequences they are. now because we found out through Merrill Hope's great article in Breitbart, Texas, yes. that the No Child Left Behind waiver that was given to Texas has some stipulations on it, yeah. like the teacher evaluations. Mm. So those very teachers that were put under this illusion that you're the bad guy are the ones who are going to suffer the most. They are, and you know what teachers mm -hmm. do best? They organize. <laughs> That's teachers right. do that best. I was married to a teacher for yes. many years. And yes. teachers, when they feel threatened and attacked, mm -hmm. man, can they come together and they can come together fast. And that's really what, w w there's a lot of hope because mm -hmm. as the truth comes out, and that's what this is all about. That's with women on the wall. Seek the truth, share the, the truth, truth, and stand mm -hmm. for the truth. And as this comes out, just like Andrew said, the ground troops are building mm -hmm. and the coalitions are coming together. Rusty, what do you see moving forward for you? This has actually created an inferno in me. Before, you know, I, I, I do say the word Jesus because he is my personal Savior. Amen. Right. Um, and I've had a lot of prayer about this even when I started this venture. Um, but as I have progressed and learned and with the attacks, I mean, the just, and teachers are making decisions based on just pure lies. Mm -hmm. You know, you would think they would be, um, they would have been more informed before they would have come together and made their decision. Wow. But what that tells me as a taxpayer, I don't have a student in the school anymore. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> um, but what I need to do, it, and thank you for doing what you do. Oh. I applaud you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but I want to be your support because working mm -hmm. with you, I'm going to be able to educate more parents, more taxpayers, 
So then, therefore, when we have this race again, then it won't be as hard. Right. You know, informed, right. informed parents, people will make the right decision if they know the information. You know, right. these parents they need to go out and they actually need to look at little Johnny's homework. They need to look at Sally's homework to see what their children are being taught. And then once they see that, it's going to open the doors for, okay, yeah, they're right. <laughs> right. You know? Exactly. So uh, I'm exactly. just, I'm on fire. Great. I'm ready for the next great. race. I wish it was tomorrow because I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Sybil? Um, well, I will be sticking around the school board for the next two years. I'm sure that excites everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> it excites us. Yes. Yes. Um, it, it, and I'm going to continue with my message. Uh, I have brought to the board, I think, about three times. Let's be transparent. Let's put these board meetings online. Let's share with our community what we're doing. Um, you know, I think the community would like to know that board members get their friends uh, contracts with the district. Ooh, wow. I think that they would like to know that the people that we hire to build our buildings, uh, a more expensive contract uh, we accept are also the same people that give us special dinners at TASB events. I think that people want to know these types of things. Let's put them online. I'm going to keep pushing for it. Um, I'm going to keep pushing to make literacy and mathematics and real history an important part of education in Crowley. That is my plan. Um, I will not vote for things that I feel um, take away from those opportunities for our kids because only a few kids will be athletics you know in right. athletics when they become an adult right but every single child in our district needs to read yeah. needs to write and needs to know how to do math so when they go to the store they're not cheated or when they go to s sign contracts on a, a mortgage they know what they're doing, you know, because I mean, right. often you'll see people sign contracts and they don't even look at them anymore. Right. We need to teach them to read those things and understand. And that's a, another thing that, you know, I think is important for, you know, everyone here to educate parents on as well is at the beginning of the year, you get a parent manual. Read that thing. <laughs> know that thing. You have rights as a parent. Yeah. But they count on you just signing that you got it and sticking it in a drawer and not knowing. There's procedures for grievances with parents. If parents with special ed children, this is something I want to say because I feel like this is extremely important for special ed parents to know, is that you are the, the state requires that, that you get um, an ARD packet from the school mm -hmm. district, a guide. They usually give that to you right before the board meet or right before your your special ed meeting. Take that book, say thank you. Say after I have read this, we will continue this meeting. Mm -hmm. Because they're counting on the fact that you haven't read that yet. Mm -hmm. You don't know what your rights are as a parent. Mm -hmm. I was a fool and did not read that for many, many, many years. And because of it, my special ed students suffered for many, many years in a public ed system and I didn't get him the services that he needed when he was younger. And so it made it harder when he was older. Had I stopped and read that book and known what my rights were as a parent, what his rights were as a special ed student, it would have made all the difference in the world at an early age for him. Um, but I thank God that I did finally sit down and read it. Um, so it, make sure as a parent you read those things and you know what's going on in your district. You know what your rights are as a parent um, and get involved. Um, the other thing is I, I'm going to continue encouraging conservatives across the state of Texas to step up and run for these positions. Um, <laughs> I, I was excited because, you know, most people know that I'm one of the very few conservatives on the school board in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see every school board in the state of Texas have someone on there that, that really cares about the issues that, you know, we're dealing with. We need to make sure that our kids are getting real education. Um, so I want to see more people step up and I'm encouraged that, uh, obviously I'm getting a little bit more popular because <laughs> I've been on almost every single person's, uh, website, uh, that, that complains about me being a conservative and they're my friends. <laughs> right. 
so it's been very, very interesting. Awesome. I mean, across the state, if you know me right. as a school board member, you're going to be associated right. with me. So I'm hoping that that will encourage them to, you know, step up. <laughs> that's right. That's good. But uh, that's right. I, I'm very excited about it. The other thing is these are partisan races, whether people know it or not. I was excited mm -hmm. when I got that email from Gary Gracia that ran against Craig Goldman because I will tell you what, he drew the line in the sand. Mm -hmm. We now have partisan races. The Democrats did it first, and we will make sure that we come back and finish it. <laughs> and really, the issue of education and the common core philosophy is not a partisan issue. But the politics of using that issue in Texas to turn Texas blue yes. are real and mm -hmm. powerful. They a are. lot of money. A mm -hmm. lot of money. And what I think is important and what we've been talking about on WBTM is that we've got to get these uh, Republicans on board with understanding because right now in the state of Texas, there is no difference between Republicans and Democrats when it comes to education. Yeah. Right. SB 6, HB 5 was passed that fundamentally transformed the education system in Texas and it was passed overwhelmingly by Republicans and Democrats. So it's, it's interesting, the left knows how to use politics, the Republicans have no idea. Uh, in my humble opinion. Well, they're well organized. Too. They're well organized Which, and they're well funded. Yeah, well. well and mm. here's the difference too. On the conservative side, all the money goes to electing conservative elected officials. Mm -hmm. And then they get to Austin and all the lobby money buys them off. Mm -hmm. What the left does is their money goes to the grassroots about issues and, and funds the grassroots to support those Democratic policy or Democrat policies that are coming out of Austin. And so the money's going to PR campaigns and, and to elect people that the grassroots money on the left is going to take them out. So it's, it's very frustrating, but as Andrew said, as all of you have said, the ground troops are building and the threat that we are to all of them mm -hmm. is votes. votes. Is votes. That's what matters. Jerry, what do you have planned <laughs> moving forward? I'm, I'm very kind of reiterating, I guess, what everybody else has said, but I, I'm during this whole process, I've been very shocked to see the irony of it, how uneducated the educators are, you know, they, <laughs> and, and they're, they, they've sent out subliminal messages, I guess, you know, to, through handouts and everything that, that my daughter comes home with, and, and I'm sure other kids come home with, but, but these teachers, you know, they, they've labeled us as the bad guys when, in reality, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm all for good teachers, and I, I think they should be paid well. I'm not trying to send any of them into poverty, um, you know, but I, it, it's, that's been the amazing part to me is how they've, mm -hmm. how they've gone to that other side and labeled us the bad guys, and, and then also the, the parents, um, you know, they're, they're out there to, they want to make, they should want to make the best decisions for their children, but they're not really interested in being educated and knowing who stands for I I had several people say, well, you know, sitting there holding the opposition sign and asking me, well, what do you stand for? Well, you should have found that out before you held his sign. And <laughs> very um, good point. You know, that, that, that's that been the surprising thing to me. So, you know, and, and um, like Misty said, I think that going forward um, I also changed the name on my on my Facebook page uh, and just I think educating the the people that we kind of in, have entrusted um, to do that are not doing it so I think you know if the mountain won't come to Muhammad then Muhammad has to go to the mountain and so I think, <laughs> I think it's uh, you know that's what we need right. to do is just to go out and 
we've tried to play nice, and, and that's just not, that's, you know, that's not. It's our kids. All right. And, so. it's our kids. and you know, another thing that I think um, that I'm going to carry this message is that the battle, the front line is locally. Mm -hmm. That's where the front Very line is. Mm -hmm. And these uh, Republicans and conservatives and those that care about, you know, what direction Texas goes in needs to realize that locally we need to really start paying attention. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because um, my eyes have definitely been open to what's going on. We can, you know, vote all these conservatives and Republicans in at these higher levels, but what goes on locally is amazing because yeah. locally they're changing things rapidly. We've got all kinds of things going on in Texas that's going on locally. Right. It's not, and I've had parents say, well, you can't get that change. You have to go through the legislator or the governor has to do that or the senators or this. And I go, not really. Right. Locally, there's a lot of power going on. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's right. what our parents and taxpayers need to realize that it's really a local issue. That's right. And when you organize locally, when that state official comes to your mm -hmm. local community for a vote, you have numbers. That's right. right. And then they will listen to mm -hmm. you. And that's the power. That's the power. Rusty, I think you had something, to, and then I want to let Rick Rose, I think he's back here, got something to all say right. too. Um, <coughs> all of us, when we, when we ran, we had specific agendas. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry's was different from mine. Misty's was different from mine. And the first part of mine was about teachers. I got to look at their salary and what they got paid. And the first thing I talked about was teachers needing more money. Mm -hmm. there, and the, the, the teacher's aides needs more money. You know, so we ran pretty consistently about what we thought needed to be changed. Our opponents had no agenda with the exception of one and we'll see if he follows through. <laughs> but the only thing they talked about is the history of the past 12 years, and our school districts are failing. So mm -hmm. I think that's something to be proud of. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. So anyway, I'll shut up. Now. Can I turn this? <laughs> um, we are so lucky here because um, we have been able to partner with WBTM, which stands for We Become the Media. Because as you guys know, the media doesn't cover this the way that it needs to be covered. And so now that you guys have become what I call the connected authority, you've been through the trenches. So now you're changing your campaign websites and people are gonna start coming to your website for information because as this is fleshed out, you are gonna be proven right. And so with th organizations like WBTM, we've had the opportunity to come to this wonderful studio and do this show, and that would not be possible if it wasn't for Mel Moss, Rick Rose, and Josh Sam Samuel. So I want to say thank you to you guys. And um, I know Rick, um, and he's got such a wonderful voice, we can't, we got to let him on the show. Well, thank you. Um, there's a couple of things that I thought of in the, in the course of today's show, and, and I think they're important. Let me tell you something I've been doing about education. I've been talking to legislators about holding the money. Don't give the money to the districts until they get right. And I know that's a critical political situation for all of these people, but here, here's the point. If you've, if you've got it and you say you are conservative, then go down there and act like one. Mm -hmm. And so we want you to hold the tax dollars that we send from the state legislature to the school districts until they meet the requirements. And then release the money. And then put a watchdog on it like you volunteers. Second thing I thought about is we've got to eliminate this nonpartisan thinking. It is not nonpartisan. Right. And we need to identify all local candidates as to their party affiliation. It must be mandatory, and that has to be done at the legislature. Require those people to declare. Now, we know that we're going to have some iffies within the ranks of conservatives. You're not going to have any iffies in the ranks of the left. They're all going to be left-minded. 
And so we know we can't do anything about that. But we can make those left-minded people in the Republican Party declare who they are. Right. Amen. And that thing, I think that's fair. Because this is a republic democracy. It's a constitutionally free society. We declare, we run, we the people do these things. They have taken that away from us. And that's why we, we're where we are. All of these charlatans are in every nook and cranny in any type of government, whether it be local, state, city, county, whatever. Our city council does the same thing in Arlington. They limit it to two minutes, and they won't let you video it because they don't want anybody outside that's not in that, in that meeting to know about it. They don't even record theirs anymore and put it up on the website. What do you think that is? <laughs> I spent my whole life in criminal investigation. Let me tell you, I recognize deceit, and it's everywhere. So I'm with you. I open up this venue for you guys again. We have... Luckily, to have Becca and Alice on our shows regularly, we want to promote it and make it bigger. And for someone out there in your in your group that want to do a show, let's bring them. Let's get this thing on the air. Get with Alice. Get with me. Mm -hmm. Get with Josh. Whomever. Let's have a show. Let's expose these people for what they are. They are charlatans. They will steal your child's education for the betterment of the elite. And that's what this is all about. Dummy down the country boys and girls, the country folks as they call them. You know, that's our name now is country folks. And give those elitist, those ruling class people, the better education. And you can bet they're not having to deal with this. That's right. Thank that's you for right. the opportunity. Uh, thank thank you all for coming in. Thank you. And you know, on with Women on the Wall, we have started a, a campaign where we are asking parents, grandparents, taxpayers to go into the school districts and say three things. Can I see? Can I see what you're teaching my child? Can I see how you're teaching my child? And can I see who's financially benefiting from the curriculum that my child's teacher is being evaluated on. And it's interesting because when you look at their uh, definition of local control with the superintendent, uh, TASB, and TASA, that's their local control and they're financially benefiting because a lot of those superintendents are retiring with full benefits and then going and becoming consultants. And so we need to start asking those questions. And I think, Andrew, it was you that said, when parents start saying, can I see what you're teaching my child? When they start asking those questions, their eyes are going to be opened and the ground troops will be multiplying. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for stepping up for running and for being that parent <laughs> that, that is willing to protect your child. And um, we will be back next week, same time, same place, with a whole nother crew. And uh, we're excited to do the work that we do. And thank you to WBTM Radio for the opportunity. Mm -hmm.